Hooray for computers! They have revolutionized everything. Look at all the facets of our lives that have been radically transformed by computers. We've gone from expensive long-distance calls on telephones to free multi-person video with people from all over the world. Photography has been transformed from clumsy film to digital cameras and photo manipulation software. Sixty years ago, Godzilla was a guy in a rubber suit. Try doing this with a guy in a rubber suit. <laughs> Games? Well, the world of games has certainly been revolutionized. You can put away your community chest and chance cards now. Paper libraries are evolving into digital libraries. How many books about rutabagas do you think your library has? A Google search on rutabagas gives over four million hits. When I was a kid, we calculated on pencil and paper. Nowadays, we have spreadsheets. In just 30 years, we've gone from handwritten notes to word processing. Television has changed from old cathode ray tubes to modern LCD displays. You couldn't do that without a computer. Drafting has changed, too. We now have 3D CAD software. Computers have changed so many other areas of our lives. The way we purchase stuff, smartphones, social networks, even pornography. But here's something odd. Computers haven't done much to change education. If computers were revolutionizing education, we'd see more money spent on educational software. But in fact, we spend only about 1% of our educational funds on computer software. It's just not that useful. This isn't for lack of effort. Plenty of bright people have been working on educational software for more than 60 years now. And all sorts of creative things have been tried, but they just haven't worked. When we compare the success we've had in all these other fields with the failure we've seen with educational software, we see a huge anomaly. So why is there such a big anomaly with education? What are we missing? What great discovery is hiding behind that anomaly? Our failure with educational software reveals that we don't understand what a computer is. The fact that we can use a computer to do some useful things doesn't prove that we understand it. You can use a screwdriver to do all sorts of useful things, such as smashing walnuts, punching holes in things. You can pry things open with a screwdriver. You can even pick your nose. But a person who's never seen a screw doesn't really understand what a screwdriver is. In the same manner, I think that most people don't understand what computers really are. After many years of cogitation, I think I may have placed my finger on the basic problem. Here's the Apple II, the hot computer of 1979. Here's the iMac, Apple's hot computer 40 years later. Let's compare these two computers. The Apple II has a clock speed of 1 megahertz. The iMac runs at 3.1 gigahertz. That's over 3,000 times faster. The Apple II has 48 kilobytes of RAM. The iMac has 8 gigabytes. That's over 150,000 times more RAM. The Apple II has just one measly little CPU, a 6502 that can handle only 8 bits at a time. The iMac has 6 CPUs, each of which can handle 32 bits at a time. That's 24 times better. The Apple II display could handle about 50,000 pixel bits. The iMac display comprises 88 million pixel bits. That's 2,000 times better. The Apple II has a floppy disk drive capable of storing 113 kilobytes. The hard drive in the Mac holds 1 terabyte. That's 10 million times better. 
When we combine all these factors, we conclude that the iMac is about 250 quintillion times more powerful than the Apple II. But hey, let's be conservative and say that the iMac is only one quintillion times more powerful. Now, wouldn't you expect the software to keep up with the hardware? I mean, if the hardware is a quintillion times better, shouldn't the software be a quintillion times better, too? Are word processors a quintillion times better? Well, they're certainly a lot better, but a quintillion times better? I don't think so. Are games a quintillion times better? Well, here's combat for the Atari 2600 from the year 1978. Here's a modern tank combat game. It's a zillion times better, right? Well, maybe a hundred times better, and maybe a, a million times better, but a quintillion times better? No way! Yes, there's been impressive progress with browsers, the internet, dating apps, photo sharing apps, social media, and a million other things. But it's the internet that made them possible, not more powerful computers. Another example is with user interfaces. The graphical user interface was introduced to the general public with the Macintosh in 1984, or 37 years ago. Has it improved a quintillion times? Well, certainly we've seen improvements. Color displays, nested menus, pop-up menus, right clicks, delayed clicks, swipes, and many more features. But these are embellishments, not radical improvements. The graphical user interfaces we're using today are not a quintillion times better than what we had 37 years ago. They're not even a million times better. They might be a a hundred times better. Here's another way to look at it. This is a screenshot taken while watching a video on YouTube. Note from the expanded portion at the bottom that the CPU activity monitor is showing that the CPUs are idle 91% of the time. In other words, even while watching a video from YouTube, which requires loading data from the internet, decompressing it on the fly, and showing the results on the screen, I'm still using only a tiny fraction of the capabilities of my computer. This is like using a Boeing 747 to taxi to work every morning. So here's the big conclusion. We don't really understand computers. Sure, we've done some great things with them, but now that computers have some real muscle, we're still using them like toys. We don't know what to do with all that power. We're like Homo habilis trying to fly the space shuttle. When I say that we don't understand computers, I mean that in the deepest sense. Uh, sure, we can program them and make them do all sorts of wonderful things, but we still don't understand the deep underlying principles, and that's preventing us from making even better software. This is to be expected. We were building and using steam engines before we understood thermodynamics. Sometimes you just had to mess around with things before you can really understand them. So what are these basic concepts? What is it about computers that we're just missing? To answer that question, we have to ask an even more basic question. What is reality? This is the big idea, the great dichotomy between object and process. Is reality a collection of objects or a system of processes? Physics is a set of laws describing the behavior of particles, which are objects, and waves, which are processes. In economics, we divide all economic output into either goods, that is, objects, or services, which are processes. In computers, we have data, that is, objects, and algorithms, that is, processes. Every program in the universe contains at least some data and at least some algorithm. At the deepest level inside the computer, we talk about bits for data and machine cycles for algorithms. 
In linguistics, we have nouns versus verbs. Nouns specify objects, while verbs specify processes. Every sentence must have at least one noun and at least one verb. Within any single language, the words make up the objects and the grammar makes up the process. In mathematics, we have numbers as objects and operators as processes. In military science, the objects are called assets, guns, tanks, and planes, and the processes are operations, moving those assets around on the battlefield. There are two fundamental studies of the body, anatomy, which concerns the parts of the body, that is, objects, and physiology, which studies the processes taking place inside the body. Now, here's the kicker. Object and process are dichotomous, but not independent. Object blurs into process. For example, in physics, we have particles and waves, but at the quantum level, something like an electron can behave like a particle sometimes and like a wave at other times. So which is it, particle or wave? Or let's take economics. When you purchase a Big Mac, is your money paying for two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, pickle, onions on a sesame seed bun, that is, goods, or is it paying for the services of the people who raised the cows, drove the trucks carrying the stuff, cooked the food, took your money, or gave you your hamburger? Is it object or process? We see the same process in linguistics. A noun can be transformed into a verb. A verb can be transformed into a noun. When the body fights an infection, we can talk about the immune system, a process, or the white blood cells that it produces, objects. So, reality is both a collection of objects and a system of processes. In some situations, it works better to think in terms of objects. In other situations, it works better to think in terms of processes. But uh, wait a second, these aren't pictures of actual processes. They are representative of processes, but they aren't processes themselves. That's because processes aren't visible. Here's what Google showed when I searched for an image of process. Those aren't processes. They're symbolic representations of processes, and you have to admit, they're pretty lame. You see, objects extend across space, but processes extend over time. We can see things in space, but our eyes can see only an instant of time. For example, when you see a tree, you see it as an object you do not see the processes taking place inside the tree. We perceive reality primarily through our eyes, yet eyes see only space. That's why we see only objects, not processes. We can't help but see objects. Our brains automatically break a scene down into component objects. Thus, most people are biased to perceive the world in terms of objects. We can see this in our language. If you look at a list of the 1,000 most frequently used words in the English language, you'll find that fully 600 of those words are nouns, pronouns, or the adjectives that describe them. But only 300 of those words are verbs or the adverbs that describe them. In other words, we use twice as many words for objects as for processes. But if you look deep inside a computer, delving right down to its beating heart, you'll find it here, the CPU, or Central Processing Unit. The computer is at its heart a processing machine. So here's why we don't truly understand computers. We tend to think in terms of objects, but computers are processing machines. In working with computers, we're like a shark out of water. Or, for that matter, a tiger in the water. Either way, we're not ready for this. Of course, 
you can learn how to think in terms of processes, but it's not going to be easy. It's not like learning to use a new browser or even a new smartphone. No, this requires a profound and fundamental change in the way you think. Fortunately, we've already developed a language that describes processes clearly and concisely, and you already know the basics. Even better, computers speak this language too. The bad news is that the first step is a little steep because the language of process is And you thought this was going to be fun, didn't you? I understand your reluctance. Mathematics requires you to twist your mind around in all sorts of unnatural ways. Mathematics does to the mind what yoga does to the body. Lots of people balk at this first step. Unsurprisingly, they're scared of math. But I'm not talking about high-powered mathematics. If you can master high school algebra and trigonometry, you've got enough to do plenty of great work. This is about the most complicated stuff you could possibly need to use. Do you remember the final scene in The Matrix? Neo bursts into a room, but Agent Smith is waiting for him. Agent Smith kills Neo. But then Trinity brings Neo back to life by the power of love. Neo stands up and looks down the hall, and he sees the truth of the Matrix. It's all numbers. Realizing that truth gives Neo the power to stop bullets. That's the kind of power that you can have when you learn how to use mathematics to articulate your ideas inside a computer. To put it another way, you can be a tiger that swims. You're probably reluctant to plunge into the sewage that is mathematics. I don't blame you. But artists must often put up with disgusting stuff to achieve their goals. The artists of the Renaissance realized that they had to attend medical dissections in order to understand the human body. Those bodies must have stank something terrible in the Italian summer heat. But these artists were determined to learn their craft, and they made detailed drawings of what they saw. Those drawings enabled them to portray the structure of the human body accurately, which enabled them to create magnificent works of art. But there are three even more important reasons why you should gird thy loins and face the demon mathematics. The first has to do with how we teach people. Our first technology for teaching was speech. This was fine for small groups, but was limited in its reach. So we invented new technologies for extending the reach of the human voice. Writing allowed us to reach an even larger audience. The printing press allowed an author to reach an even greater audience. The 20th century brought an explosion of technologies for spreading our ideas to ever larger audiences. For example, cinema, radio, television, and now the Internet. But there's one common shortcoming with all these media. They can't show processes. They show object, facts, numbers, images, data, things. This is all well and good, I suppose. But if you want to show how the world works, why things happen the way they do, then you need to teach processes. And these media struggle mightily to express process. Process is the essence of what computers do. Computers are the ideal technology for teaching processes. <laughs> the only technology. That is the revolutionary significance of computers. Not Twitter or YouTube or Amazon or Google. 
This mighty leap in educational capability has major implications for the betterment of humanity. That's the first reason why you should take this plunge. The second reason for learning how to create algorithms has to do with how we learn. Honestly, is this how you learn about a new computer app? Or is this how you learn? By playing around with the app. Play is the original educational technology, developed by mammals more than a hundred million years ago. We can most easily see the educational use of play in kittens. They teach themselves the skills they will need to survive in the wild. They do it by hunting each other. They chase each other. They practice combat with each other. This is not how kittens play. This is not how kittens learn. The third reason for embracing mathematics arises from the fact that traditional expository media treat their audiences as passive receptacles of information. The students are expected to sit on their butts and passively watch and listen. But the human mind is an active agent, not a passive receptacle. We learn by doing, not by watching. There is only one medium that teaches by having the student actively do something rather than passively watch or listen to something. And that is software equipped with algorithms that the student directly interacts with. So how do we pull this off? How do we build educational software using process instead of object? Let's be specific. Let's examine educational software on the topic of climate change. Now, good educational software manifests its processes through simulations. And the word simulation usually refers to highly technical programs whose purpose is to accurately predict the behavior of complicated systems. However, we're not talking about those kinds of simulations. We want to build educational simulations. The difference between a technical simulation and an educational simulation is the difference between a scientific paper and a school textbook. The goal isn't perfect scientific correctness, but simplicity and clarity. I searched the internet for educational software and climate change, and I got a lot of hits. This was the first one I looked at. I was disappointed. It was just a bunch of expository stuff, facts about climate change. There wasn't anything to do. No processes, no interaction. The second hit wasn't any better. It was just a collection of stories about environmental issues. Same with the third hit. And the fourth. And the fifth. And the sixth. The educational software I found about climate change is all object and no process. Lots of facts and figures and graphs and images, but no simulation, no process, and no interaction. I'm sure there's got to be something out there somewhere, but I couldn't find it. So let me show you the climate change simulation that I'm working on. It's called Balance of the Planet. I self-published the first version back in 1990, then another, much improved version in 2013. Now I'm working on the third, vastly improved version. The educational purpose of this program is to demonstrate to the player just how complicated our environmental problems are and how they're all interconnected. I also want to teach people that there are no easy solutions to these problems. The game begins in the year 2025 and runs to the year 2100 for a total of 75 years. Each of the pages shows you one of the critical factors that is calculated by the simulation. 
Let's start at the end and work backwards. This page shows you your total score. Now, all of the pages in the simulation have the same basic structure. At the top here, you get the title of the page, total score. Just underneath it, you get the numerical value of that, which in this case is zero because we haven't begun playing. Next comes a pretty picture. And then on the right, we get some text explaining what this means. Along the bottom, we get controls, four columns of different controls that allow you to explore different options. First come the causal factors that determined this total score. Next come some, fun, some very important controls that I'll have to explain later. Next come the effects of this particular page. In this case, there aren't any because it's the last page in the simulation. And finally, there are some game controls. Now, let's start by looking at whatever caused this total score. Why do we have a score of zero points? Well, we look at the causal factor, which in this case is the annual score. So to do that, we simply click on the button. And that takes us to this page. The annual score is the score you earn in each of the 75 years that the game covers. It is the result of four different scores. The standard of living score, the rich death score, the poor death score, and the Gaia score. Uh, let's just look at one, the uh, Gaia score. I click on that button, and here we are at the Gaia score. Now, in Greek mythology, Gaia is the personification of the Earth. Your Gaia score is the measure of how well you have protected the Earth. As you can see, there are three factors that determine your Gaia score. Extinction, habitat loss, and something called Gaia value. I'll have to explain that later. For now, let's just look at the extinction page. We humans have been wiping out species for a long time now, and it's getting worse every year. These are just a few of the species we have destroyed. Three factors contribute to extinction. Acid rain, ocean acidification, and rainforest clearing. Let's have a look at ocean acidification. Again, we see a detailed explanation of this factor in the column on the right. Now, here's a nice feature. Notice that near the top of the column, is the underlined phrase greenhouse effect, and it's in a different color. That should make your finger itchy to go click on it because it's obviously a link of some sort. Let's give it a whirl. I click, and bingo, here's the explanation of the greenhouse effect. Now, this is not a page on the internet. It's part of the Balance of the Planet program, but it's not one of the simulation factors. I call it a background. It explains the greenhouse effect. Notice that it has its own purple link as well. That is, uh, if we click on that, we can go to another page for thermodynamic equilibrium. And this explains the concept of thermodynamic equilibrium. And there are links to other pages and on and on and on. These pages explain the science behind climate change. They explain a lot of other stuff too, like different kinds of power plants, how solar cells work, how markets affect the environment, strip mining, and the biggest vehicle on the planet, the Bagger 288. Now, you can peruse these pages to your heart's content, but let's just get back to the game. So I'll, to do that, I just click on the back button a couple of times, and here we are back at ocean acidification. Let me show you one other feature. If I scroll down to the very bottom of the text, you'll see these additional links here. These are links to resources on the internet. So if I click on this one, we go to a page by the National Oceane Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which describes ocean acidification. Now, I have lots of these external links scattered throughout the whole program. One of my goals is to provide you with a deeper uh, information about these topics, 
And another goal is to show different points of view, different sides of the story. So let's go back to ocean acidification now and see what causes it. That cause is the atmospheric CO2 concentration. So we go there. Now this graph dramatically shows how atmospheric carbon dioxide has really shot up in the last 125 years. Why? Because of net CO2 emissions. So let's go check that out. Here are the net CO2 emissions. As you can see, these have two causal factors, anthropogenic CO2 emissions and induced CO2 emissions. Anthropogenic just means human-made, but anthropogenic makes you seem so much smarter than human-made. Induced emissions are emissions that are natural but are triggered by rising temperatures. If we click on anthropogenic human anthropogenic CO2 emissions, we see that all the things that use we use to add CO2 to the atmosphere. There are four causal factors listed: coal, oil, natural gas, and rainforest clearing. Uh, let's look at coal production. Here we get into an explanation of the use of coal to provide energy. Now we're starting to get to the real core of the problem. The coal we burn is putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, we need to do something about this. Here's we get where we get to the place where we can actually do something about climate change. I'll skip a few steps and jump directly to the taxes page by clicking on this button here. This is where you can discourage activities that are harmful to the environment. You get to tax four types of activities. One is air pollution. You can increase or decrease the amount of tax per ton of air pollution. Then there's carbon dioxide, which you can also change. Nuclear energy, you can tax that, or habitat loss. You can set whatever taxes you want to each of these activities. So they're useful for two reasons. One, they discourage the activities that are harmful. And two, they provide income for the piggy bank, which we use to provide subsidies. So let's look at the subsidies page. There are four areas of activity that you can subsidize. Subsidize Scientific research, education in poor countries, infrastructure like you know, roads and bridges and such, and finally, public transport. Now, each of these uh, is taking some percentage of the overall amount in the piggy bank, but if you want to emphasize one of them, say, you want to spend more money on research, you can increase that, but it will decrease the others. So maybe you think education should get the lion's share, or no, how about infrastructure, or maybe public transport? You can change these in any way you want to encourage and increase the amount of this activity. Now we come to the real kicker something you seldom see in an educational simulation. You see, many of our environmental problems come from our value systems. Different people value different things in different ways. In this page here, the values page, you get to declare your personal values. You specify how many points you gain or lose for different aspects of our overall situation. So, there are Gaia points. These are points that you gain or lose for improving or harming the environment. Uh, now, deaths, these de deaths concern people who die as a result of climate change or air pollution or any of a number of other environmental factors. But I've split it up into two different groups. One group consists of rich people. Uh, some of them, rich people, are killed by various environmental problems. Others are poor people, and they're killed by, uh, they can also be killed by 
environmental issues. It's just that we, in the, uh, we Americans, many people all over the world, boy, I blew that. Let, let's skip over this. It's just that we value rich people and poor people differently. That is, the real world looks something like this. We don't really worry that much about poor people dying, but we worry a lot about rich people dying. Now, you may think that that's not right. Perhaps you think that they should all be the same, so you would set them both to say, oh, 50 points per death. That's very nice, and if you do this, you are guaranteed to suffer a disastrous loss. You'll have to learn why. Finally, there's the standard of living, which is basically a measure of material wealth of humanity. And you'll find that Gaia points are in direct conflict with standard of living points, because if you want more material wealth, you're going to need more industry, which is going to make more pollution, which is going to cost Gaia points. So. Basically, there's no right or wrong here. It's just a matter of what your own values are. How do you rate the various issues of human well-being? This is where you get to say. So, let me go over two other features of the game. The first is the index right down here. I'm going to stop at this point. Now we come to the real kicker, something you seldom see in an educational simulation. You see, many of our environmental problems come from our value systems. Different people value different things in different ways. In this page, you have to declare your personal values. You specify how many points you gain or lose for different aspects of our overall situation. For example, we all like to think that we want to protect the Earth. In this game, that's done with Gaia points. You specify how many points you lose for damage to the environment. If your love for the environment is strong, then you should set this number to be very high, like, say, oh, 80 points per Gaia. If, on the other hand, you think there's too much moaning and groaning about the environment, then set it low to maybe oh, 20 points per Gaia. Next come the point assignments for the number of people who die from various environmental problems, like air pollution or flooding from climate change. But there's a nasty little twist here. We divide the world into rich countries, like the USA, Europe, and Japan, and poor countries like Botswana and Pakistan. We can assign different point values to deaths among rich people and deaths among poor people. This matters because there are a lot more deaths among poor people than among rich people. Sure, you're an idealist. You believe that every life is equally valuable. Okay, go ahead and set both values to the same value. Let's say 50 points. <clears throat> You're in for a shock. All those poor deaths are going to ruin your score. The only way to win is to set rich deaths to be much more valuable than poor deaths. Hypocrisy hurts, doesn't it? Lastly come points for the average standard of living of people all over the world. This comes from material wealth, and to produce lots of material wealth, you'll need lots of industry and commerce but that's going to generate more damage to the environment and cost you Gaia points. There's another ugly trade-off here. Isn't this fun? Let me show you two other features of the game. The first is the index, which you get by clicking on this button right here. When you click on it, you get to see all 78 of the factors at work in the game. Wow! There are a lot of factors to consider, aren't there? You can jump to see any one of these by simply clicking on its button. Uh, for example, we can look at forest fires, or go back to the industry and look at uh, lung disease deaths. Uh, yes, it's uh, cute, but uh, complicated. Next, if you want to see how everything is connected, 
you click on the connections button and you get one gigantic diagram showing you how all of the factors affect each other. Oh dear, this looks pretty complicated, doesn't it? Oh well, that's the reality of environmental problems. So, to play the game, you peruse all the values and uh, causes and effects, then you set your taxes, your subsidies, and your values, then you press the Execute Policies button. Now, I don't have that working yet, but I've got most of it in place. It takes a lot of code. Now, the game is actually only one turn long. You set your policies, you execute them, and the game processes how everything changes over each of the next 75 years. Then it shows you how your total score changed over the 75-year period of the game. Now, this game is only one turn long. You set your policies, execute them, and the game processes how everything changes over each of the next 75 years. Then it shows you how your total score changed over the 75-year period of the game. Now, I haven't gotten this feature working on the current version yet, so this is a screenshot from the 2013 version of the game. As you can see, in this game, the players started off pretty well, but then things really went bad towards the end. Why? Well, once again, you have to look at the causal factors to understand why this happened. So, here's the annual score, which consists of three uh, contributing factors. The first is the lifestyle, is the standard of living uh, score in orange, and then there is the rich death score in pink, and finally in green is the Gaia score. Now, as you can see, it started off fairly positive, but then it started dropping negative, and it just got worse and worse and worse. So, that's one way of looking at it, but we can also look at some other factors, such as climate change costs. And here you can see the real problem. The costs of climate change as a percentage of global GDP started off small, but they rose to huge values, like 6.67% of global GDP. The global GDP increase has been increasing by maybe 5% per year. In general, people are fairly happy when GDP is increasing by about 3% per year. If it actually starts falling, then people get upset. And if climate change is costing 6.67% of global GDP, and GDP is only rising by 5%, then people are getting poorer every year. That's why this thing turned out to be a failure. Now, there are plenty of other features I'd like to add to the game, but I'm hoping to have this thing done by the end of this year, so we'll just have to see. Let's move on. This is all very impressive, but now the time has come for me to get down to nuts and bolts. How do I make this big, complicated monstrosity work? The mathematics involved is actually rather simple in most cases. In my current set, 85% of the factors at work use algorithms that rely only on addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So we're not talking about high-powered mathematics. Here are a few examples of these algorithms. Here's a simple, easy one. Uh, now, this is written in the JavaScript programming language, which is pretty simple. Let me explain it in detail. The first line of code here says that the next three lines calculate the amount of net CO2 emissions. The second line says that something called result is equal to how much anthropogenic CO2 emissions there are at this point in time. The third line says that the amount of induced CO2 emissions should be added to the result. The fourth line says that the result is the answer. In other words, this function calculates the amount of net CO2 emissions 
which is simply the sum of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions and the induced CO2 emissions. So we simply add them together. What could be simpler? Here's the same concept, only bigger. The net energy production is the sum of all the different sources of energy, coal, oil, nuclear, solar, and so forth. So we just add them all up. Again, easy peasy. This one is a little different. It uses multiplication instead of addition. The little asterisk is programming language for multiply. This function calculates the total amount of acid rain, which is produced only by air pollution. So we just multiply the amount of air pollution by 0.52. Uh, where does that 0.52 come from? Uh, uh, I'll explain that in a minute. This is the same concept. Lung disease deaths are caused by air pollution. The total number of lung disease deaths is proportional to the amount of air pollution. So I just multiply the amount of air pollution by a constant factor. Again, I'll have to explain where that number 2000 comes from later. This algorithm combines addition and multiplication. It calculates the total number of species rendered extinct by environmental damage. There are three sources of this environmental damage, acid rain, ocean acidification, and rainforest clearing. But they're not all equally dangerous. Ocean acidification is the most destructive force, so I multiply it by 5,000. Acid rain is less dangerous, so I multiply it by only 300. Finally, rainforest clearing is the least destructive of these three destructive factors, so I multiply it by only 0.5. Here's another example of the same principle. This algorithm calculates the total induced CO2 emissions, which are driven by forest fires and permafrost emissions. Now, permafrost emissions are the most important factor, so we add them in directly. But forest fires produce less CO2 than permafrost, so I multiply them by 0 0.00006. This greatly reduces the impact of forest fires in the calculation. Okay, so now I have to explain where all those numbers come from. That's where my knowledge of the topic comes in. Remember, the whole point of creating a simulation is to communicate your thinking to your audience. I once had an English teacher who used to say, if you can't say it, you don't know it. The converse of that is that if you do know it, then you can say it. Although in the case of simulation, you must learn how to say it mathematically. If you can teach something using your own words, why can't you teach it with your own numbers? Of course, I don't just make up the numbers. I get the numbers by doing my research. Yes, it's a lot of work, but you, know, you already go through a lot of work learning the subjects you teach. This is just another kind of work, digging up the numbers. Now, you can sometimes find numbers in magazine articles. But the web is a much better source. It's full of information on just about every topic. Here's a page I found that provides numbers for the amount of CO2 produced by forest fires. Here's a web page I found that presents numbers for taxation of carbon dioxide emissions. This page lists some of the extreme events that took place in America last year. There's a huge website called Our World in Data that's chock full of numbers about just about everything. This particular page presents data on the causes of rainforest destruction in the Brazilian Amazon Basin. The primary skill you need to pull this off is a knack for searching the web. This really is becoming an important skill these days. After many years, I've gotten pretty good at figuring out the best words and phrases to find what I'm looking for. But I have to admit, I've been a complete failure at figuring out how to find chocolate-covered rutabagas. As you do your research, remember this. 
A lot of people think that a simulation must be held to higher standards of rigor and exactness than other forms of expression. This is silly. Simulation is just another way to express ideas. An educational simulation is most emphatically not a scientific simulation. It is held to the same standards as any other educational expression. Clarity and appropriateness to the audience are the primary goals, not scientific exactness. Don't be intimidated by the nerds. You have a job to do, to teach people. For the first time in history, we have the equipment, computers, that can teach the other half of reality, processes. We need pioneers who will effectively utilize that equipment. That's you. Good luck.